In case you hadn't heard, Volvo estates are curvier and sportier these days, as is ably demonstrated by this much improved V60. Despite its sleeker styling direction, the car isn't a clone of its German compact executive rivals, still majoring in Volvo virtues like safety, comfort and practicality. Also included though is a rewarding driving experience and the option of the class leading combination of performance and efficiency you get with the Drive E 2 litre D4 diesel engine most will want. Potentially it's a surprising package. If you never imagined yourself owning a Volvo estate car, then this is the one the brand wants you to try, the V60. Estate cars, of course, used to be the things you bought to carry around loads of kit. Not anymore. These days, most people wanting to do that will buy an MPV or an SUV, leaving estates to focus almost completely on style and driving dynamics, which is why compact executive wagons like Audi's A4 Avant and BMW's 3 Series Touring can't actually carry much more than the saloons upon which they're based. Now you wouldn't expect Volvo, the solid traditional brand that pioneered the kind of boxy estate car into which you could fit a fridge or several, to want much to do with this kind of trendy form over function approach. And you'd be wrong. The Swedish maker actually invented this style conscious market niche long before the German brands turned up bringing us the classic P1800E model that Roger Moore drove as the Saint way back in the 60s. But it took them until late in 2010 to return to it with this car, the V60. This apparently isn't an estate anyway. According to Volvo's publicity material, I'm to call it a sports wagon. Now, I'm not going to do that, but you've got the idea. The type of baggage that Gothenburg doesn't want this car to carry is the historical kind that might see this V60 associated with pipe and slippers bound antique dealers for whom sheer driving pleasure is neither desirable or required. This was once a market Volvo was bound to, but the introduction of their BMW 3 Series sized S60 saloon in mid-2010 changed all of that. Here was a car that could really reward at the wheel. Here was a car you could mention in the same breath as its German prestige rivals. And here was a car ready and waiting for a sleek, low-slung, style-conscious estate variant. Exactly like this one. The V60's initial promise, though, was never going to be completely fulfilled with the reliance on other people's engine technology it was first launched with. So, for the fully improved version, launched early in 2014, Volvo has bought us some of its own, in a D4 diesel variant, offering a combination of performance and efficiency that no rival can match. There are smarter looks too, and extra technology, all delivered without sacrificing the substance and safety part of the brand value proposition. Does it all add up? Let's put this car to the test. You might not approach the idea of driving a Volvo estate car with much enthusiasm, something which might be justified if here we were talking about the Swedish brand's bigger V70 station wagon, or worse, one of its older estate models. But we're not. Here's a car based on an S60 four-door model the Mark describes as a premium sports saloon and it runs on the underpinnings of a Ford Mondeo, universally recognized as one of the most dynamically adept family cars out there. In other words, there are great grounds for optimism when it comes to the on-the-road experience. Optimism largely justified once you're up to speed, provided you take the trouble to adjust your thinking into the distinctly Volvo feel this car has. True, it isn't quite as sharp either to steer or to throw around the bends as rival BMW or Audi models, but apparently that's entirely intentional. The Swedish brand reckons that such cars are too stiffly set up, robbing them in extremis of the security and predictability that create a really fluid drive. Now, it's an arguable point, but I have to agree that you really do feel confident at speed at the wheel of this car. If you're prepared to throw the Labradors around a bit in the back, 
the bends flow together beautifully and it's as sure-footed as any of its rivals when conditions turn nasty. The reasons why have much to do with a dynamic chassis carefully developed over the most demanding British B roads. Now you can take this a step further by opting for an R design model with stiffer suspension, but personally I wouldn't. This firm setup dilutes one of this car's greatest virtues, the composed ride it offers over poor services, superior in fact to what's on offer in this car's German rivals. No, there are other ways to make a V60 handle more sharply that don't involve higher chiropractor's bills. Namely, a tick in the box for the optional 4C, that stands for Continuously Controlled Chassis Concept, Active Chassis, with adaptive damping that via comfort, sport or advanced settings enables the driver to alter the character of the car based on the road that you're on and the mood that you're in. Even if you do without this feature, a couple of other standard inclusions are enough to offer up a surprising degree of dynamic brio. First, the surprisingly quick and direct steering setup, and secondly, torque vectoring, a system that works through the turns to counter both understeer and wheel spin by lightly micro-braking whichever front wheel is threatening to lose grip, firing you on from bend to bend in a way that will be revolutionary to long-time Volvo owners. Now if you're in a D4 diesel model as I am here, you'll also benefit from a reduction in engine weight of as much as 90 kilograms in comparison to some of the other drivetrains across the range. With less bulk to carry around up front, this car feels even more eager to turn in. And all this from a V60 that still manages to offer more relaxed long distance refinement than any car the Mark has yet produced. It's a surprising drive. But I haven't yet talked about engines. This is something I'm not normally very prescriptive about in sharing driving impressions on films like this. Different owners do, after all, have different needs when it comes to specifying what lies under the bonnet. With this improved V60 model though, I'm gonna make an exception to that rule. I can't really see why you'd buy this car with any engine other than the D4 diesel unit I'm trying here. To understand why that is, a little background information is needed. As a brand, Volvo has traditionally relied on Ford engine wear for its modern era models. A safe approach, but not a very profitable one. Which is why when the Chinese Zhangjiang Geely Corporation acquired the company in 2010, the first priority was to make the Gothenburg maker self-sufficient in the underbonnet department. Clearly such a goal would take time to accomplish, which was why the original version of this V60 model was first launched with the same Ford-derived 1.6, 2.0-litre and 2.4-litre engines used in other Volvo models. But behind the scenes, the engineers were hard at work completing their own in-house range of power plants, the so-called Drive E range of engines. All of these will be two litres in size, either petrol or diesel, with a lineup of different power outputs broad enough to eventually completely replace the existing Ford units. For the time being though, only one of the new generation Drive E engines has been brought to market, the 181 brake horsepower 16 valve diesel power plant you'll find in the D4 model that I'm driving here. At a stroke, this engine makes the typical Volvo salesperson's job rather awkward, as it's cleaner and more economical than the feeblest 115 brake horsepower 1.6 litre D2 V60, but faster and more responsive than the priciest diesel in the lineup, the most powerful 215 brake horsepower 2.4 litre D5 V60 variant. Now let's be more specific as well as being able to average nearly 75 bars to the gallon and emit under 100 grams per kilometre of CO2. This D4 gets to 62 miles an hour from rest in just 7.6 seconds on the way to 140 miles an hour. Even if you opt for the 8-speed automatic version, those stats are hardly affected. Such are the benefits of modern technology. Of course, there's always the possibility that your budget may not be able to stretch up to D4 purchase, or that you might be offered an unmissable deal on a V60 with one of the older engines. 
to allow for that scenario, I'll tell you that if you opt for a 1.6 litre D2 variant or choose to boost your diesel V60's power up to 136 brake horsepower in the 2 litre D3 model, you're looking at a 0 to 62 mile an hour sprint time of around 11 seconds en route to a maximum speed in the region of 120 miles an hour. In the top diesel 215 brake horsepower D5 version, those figures are improved to 7.5 seconds and 143 miles an hour. Readings you can up a little further by paying extra for a Polestar performance pack that marginally boosts the power output to 230 brake horsepower. But if you do that, you'll end up paying a lot of money for a car that still isn't a better all-round package than the V60 D4 that I'm driving here. Before finishing, I also ought to touch upon the minority interest D6 plug-in hybrid all-wheel drive version, which mates the D5 diesel variant's 215 brake horsepower five-cylinder power plant, pushing you along at the front with a 70 brake horsepower electric motor driving the rear wheels. So it's nominally all-wheel drive and very futuristic with three driving modes from which to choose. Pure, hybrid and power all operating via a six-speed Geartronic automatic gearbox. In pure mode, the car would run in two-wheel drive only and offers a 32-mile range on electric-only power, though you won't go anywhere near that far if you start to approach the theoretical 78-mile-an-hour battery-powered maximum. Go for hybrid, or power, and the car functions in all-wheel drive form, running on a mixture of diesel and electric motion. Go for the power setting and it's certainly fast, hitting 62 miles an hour in just 6.1 seconds on the way to 143 miles an hour. Not bad for a car theoretically capable of an astonishing 155 miles to the gallon. If only it was more affordable. Until it is, give me a D4 V60 any day of the week. Lots of people will have a clear picture in their head of what a Volvo estate looks like. This won't be it. Where old Volvo designs were a riot of right angles, this one has barely a straight line on it. It's so-called racetrack design producing lines that flow organically into each other, like the curves of a race circuit. It's not just different for the sake of being so though. The alert stance, short overhangs and sleek low roof line make this car's silhouette closer to that of a coupe than a boxy estate. This updated version gets what Volvo describes as more focused and determined looking headlamps added to create what's intended to be a more expressive front end. The V60's horizontal lines have also been emphasised at both the front and the rear, and together with details such as a wider grille and daytime running lights, the various changes give this car a more striking, purposeful presence. Under the skin, there's a chassis originally borrowed from the Ford Mondeo, which means the underpinnings are exactly the same as those used in the brand's supposedly larger V70 Estate and S80 Saloon models. The sweeping styling takes its toll, of course, when it comes to practicality. Though the 430 litre load bay is, as you'd expect, much bigger than the boot space on offer in this car's S60 saloon design stablemate, you're talking around 10% less cargo room than you get in the rival's Volvo hopes you'll be comparing this model to. Cars like Audi's A4 Avant or BMW's 3 Series Touring. Volvo, though, is unrepentant. For one thing, the company points out that the V60's seats folded capacity of 1,421 litres is within a whisker of those German rivals. For another, the company points out that in an age when every shop will deliver bulky items, there aren't many buyers needing to transport them. And for those that do, there are V70s, XC70s and XC90s further up the Volvo range. In any case, it's undeniable that the three metre long space that is on offer here is very accessible and easy to use. The rear bench splits 40, 20, 40 and drops down completely flat while the front passenger seat can do likewise to accommodate really long items like surfboards and bikes. You get a lockable underfloor compartment to keep 
valuables away from prying eyes, plus net pockets and a grocery bag holder to keep your shopping upright. I especially like this shallow hinged compartment on top of the boot floor. Lift up the flap and you can mess up the floor with muddy stuff. Then when you remove your wellies or whatever, the flap goes down again and you don't have to worry about cleaning the boot floor. Well, not immediately anyway, out of sight and out of mind and all that. Desirable options include a telescopic alloy frame which slides along rails to segment your load space. Then there's a hot box which connects to a power outlet in the estate compartment to keep either food warm or drinks cold. In the rear seat, you get marginally more headroom than you would in an S60 saloon. But otherwise accommodation on offer is much the same which means that there's comfortable room for two adults, but as with virtually every other car in this sector, adding a middle occupant would make things a bit tight on a journey of any real distance. Now that occupant wouldn't be especially comfortable either, thanks to the narrow curved centre seat that they've to be perched upon. Three children will be quite happy though, and their parents may want to consider specifying the neat two-stage fold-out booster seats that fold out of the seat base cushions. At the wheel, the most important part of any car, according to Volvo's head of design, it's all very nice indeed, with a premium feel right across the V60 range that you only really get on the more expensive versions of BMW, Audi and Mercedes rivals. The idea is that, like IKEA furniture, this cabin should be typically Scandinavian. Comfortable, simple, intuitive and visually pleasing. And broadly it is now, thanks to a subtle redesign which has introduced smarter materials and silk metal frames around the air vents and light controls, plus a redesigned gear knob. One of the nicest touches that's worth shelling out a little extra for is the high-tech TFT instrument display. With the flick of a switch, you can choose between three different dial layouts. An amber backlit elegant setting for comfort orientated day-to-day -day motoring, a green backlit eco setting to help you drive more economically, and a red backlit performance mode to better suit for more spirited driving, the kind of thing the Swedish brand hopes this second generation model's slightly lower driving position and smaller steering wheel will put you in the mood for. It'll also help in this respect that the signature Volvo floating centre console is angled more towards the driver for a greater cockpit style feel. That'll be familiar if you owned an early version of this second generation model. New to you though will be the clever Sensus Connect navigation and infotainment system that allows you to add connectivity and internet access uh, into the car. Now, this setup turns the 7-inch infotainment display that you get on the dash into a state-of-the-art infrared beam scan colour screen that can be used even when wearing gloves, a world first. As the driver, you've the choice of going online, either via a car-mounted 3G, 4G dongle, or by using your own mobile phone. High-tech features include a uh, voice activation system that works on all music sources and the industry's first in-dash fully integrated voice search Spotify application. It's also possible to share a Wi-Fi network with everyone in the car. Of course it's possible to get carried away with gadgetry like this and forget more crucial considerations. The seats, for example. It's remarkable how little importance we attach to the things we'll be sitting on in our cars, given that we'll be spending many hundreds or thousands of hours in the things. And down the years, Volvo has quietly earned a reputation for making the comfiest chairs in the business. This V60 continues that form line with what have to be uh, the most supportive yet wonderfully pillowy seats in the compact executive estate sector. The sports seat in the R design model is particularly good, positioning you beautifully throughout the longest drive. The market has traditionally seen this V60 as a compact executive estate. 
Volvo's take on the genre defined by German contenders like Audi's A4 Avant, BMW's 3 Series Touring and the Mercedes C-Class Estate. While you could certainly consider a plush of the 60 variant against any of these contenders, you can, after all, find yourself uh, easily paying in the 30 to 35,000 pound bracket or more for a really plush and powerful version of this car. A huge proportion of UK V60 sales are made in the 23 to 26,000 pound bracket, or to put it another way, three to 4,000 pounds below equivalent A4, 3 Series or C-Class models. So it's a slightly different proposition. You could, in other words, quite accurately say there's nothing quite like a V60, and there's certainly nothing quite like the V60 I have here, the D4 diesel variant that every Volvo dealer will want, potential buyers to try first, with a high-tech drive-e engine offering an unrivaled combination of performance and efficiency. Now, I'm sure there must be other estate cars on the market capable of sprinting from rest to 62 miles an hour in around seven and a half seconds, yet still able to average nearly 75 miles to the gallon and emit less than 100 grams per kilometre of CO2. I'm struggling, though, to think of one right now. Though the V60 lineup does offer a couple of petrol options, the 150 brake horsepower T3 and the potent 306 brake horsepower T6, almost all buyers want a diesel, and these people would do well to find the premium necessary to bypass the old Ford-derived engines you'll find in lesser bottom-of-the-range V60 models, a 1.6 in the D2 and a 2-litre unit in the D3, to get themselves a slice of D4 motoring. D4 pricing starts from just over £24,000, so you're looking at less than £2,000 more than what you'd pay for the cheapest, feeblest, and actually less frugal, D2 entry-level V60. Whichever mainstream V60 variant you choose, there's the option of paying around £1,500 more for the expected automatic transmission option, though in this case all auto gearboxes aren't the same. The older units, the Ford-derived power shift system you get on D2 and T3 models, and Volvo's familiar Geartronic setup as fitted to D3, D5 and T6 variants, well, they both have six speeds. More modern and efficient, though, is the more sophisticated eight-speed Geartronic transmission that this D4 model gets. It's yet another reason why V60 buyers should choose this particular engine derivative. The one variant I haven't yet mentioned is the cleverest, the D6 all-wheel drive plug-in hybrid flagship version. It's the segment's first plug-in hybrid design, using the same 215 brake horsepower five-cylinder diesel unit as the Pokius D5 model, but mating it to a 70 brake horsepower electric motor and an all-wheel drive powertrain. Unfortunately, there's a substantial cost for all this futuristic technology, and you'll need a £45,000 budget for ownership, even after the generous £5,000 government grant is subtracted from the asking price. Early adopters, then, will need deep pockets. Most V60 buyers, though, will have a more budget-orientated mindset and will be keen to know just how much kit mainstream variants include as standard. The answer is that all models are, in fact, pretty generously specified. Across the range, you can expect to find features like alloy wheels of at least 16 inches in size, LED daytime running lights, parking sensors, Bluetooth phone compatibility, cruise control, climate control, Volvo's sensor satellite navigation system and a high quality stereo setup, including a DAB radio and controls on the leather wrapped steering wheel. There's also a census connect with high performance sound system that plays DVDs and uses the dashboard's integrated seven inch display screen to connect you through to selected web apps and an internet browser. Further up the range, there are niceties like leather trim, a power-operated driver's seat, and xenon headlamps that actively bend with the road to better illuminate your way at night. I might be tempted by the opportunity of specifying better-looking 19-inch wheels, which can keep the same profile height as 18 inches, so don't compromise ride comfort. 
And I'd also want to find the extra £1,000 necessary to get my car fitted with the Clever 4C adaptive damping system, via which you can set up the suspension to suit the mood that you're in and the road that you're on. What really makes this car stand out though is its safety provision. Volvo safety used to be all about protecting you after you'd had an accident. Now, more laudably, it's more about making sure you don't have one in the first place. Headlining the standard features is the impressive city safety system. This is Volvo's technology for avoiding low speed collisions in city traffic and tailbacks. If you're about to drive into the vehicle in front and the electronics sense that you're not going to react, the car will break itself. Volvo was the first manufacturer in the world to offer this type of setup as standard. There's plenty of other electronic assistance too. Torque vectoring is now standard, a system which works through the turns to counter both understeer and wheel spin by lightly micro-braking whichever front wheel is threatening to lose grip. This system works as an integral part of the DSTC Dynamic Stability and Traction Control Package. Passive safety kit, meanwhile, includes twin front, side and curtain airbags that work with Volvo's SIPS, that's the Side Impact Protection System, plus Isofix child seat fastenings. If you want to go further, then there's the option of a driver support pack, including a whole raft of electronic cleverness for a premium of just under £2,000. Collision warning with full auto brake, well, that's a system that scans the road ahead for potential accidents at higher speeds, while pedestrian and cyclist detection specifically targets people and bikers. ACC Adaptive Cruise Control and Distance Alert uses a radar to keep you a safe distance from the car ahead on the highway, while on automatic models there's also a cue assist feature that senses a highway tailback and can automatically take you right back to a standstill and off again without leaving cruise control. The BLIS, that's the B-L-I-S, Blind Spot Information System, with cross-traffic alert, well that will stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake in front of another car. There's a lane keeping system to stop dozy drivers from veering out of their lanes on the highway, and DAC driver alert control will monitor your driving reactions during a journey and suggest a stop for a restorative coffee if the electronics sense that you're getting drowsy. Finally, there's a roadside information display that displays speed limit and road warning signs on the dash as you pass them, and high beam assist that'll automatically dip your high beam for you at night in the face of oncoming traffic. With that little lot fitted, you'll be doing very well indeed to have an accident in this car. However you choose to exactly classify it, this V60 is an executive car, but it needn't come with executive segment running costs. Quite the opposite, in fact. What if I were to tell you that the fuel and CO2 costs of running one of these were about the same as a little 1.5 litre Ford Fiesta diesel Super Mini? Well, that's just what I'm going to tell you. Fitted with Volvo's latest generation drive E 2 litre diesel engine, a V60 D4 variant like the one I'm trying here delivers 74.3 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle. There are impressive CO2 emissions too. For the first time, Volvo has achieved a sub 100 grams per kilometre showing in one of its models, 99 grams per kilometre in this case, a reading that no diesel powered compact executive estate of any kind can get anywhere near. Even eco poster cars like BMW's supposedly super frugal 320D touring efficient dynamics model, which incidentally costs around £5,000 more and will cost you around £500 a year more to tax. So, how has Volvo done it? As you would expect, there's fuel saving, electric power steering and a stop start system to cut the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. But the technology goes a lot deeper than that. I won't go into the technicalities, but the savings have been achieved through things like the reduction of inner friction in the engine, more precise fuel injection, 
smart heat management in the engine, um, advanced combustion control, and the use of a special fuel pump. Competitors really need to take one of these uh, drive E engines apart and see how it's all been done. Your running cost returns aren't even very significantly affected if, as I probably would, you specify your V60 D4 with Volvo's high-tech 8-speed automatic gearbox. Expect 67.3 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 109 grams per kilometre. That's because this auto transmission has a clever Eco Plus feature that, when activated, softens throttle response, tweaks the climate control and the turbo cut-in point, changes the gear shift pattern and adds an Eco Coast function that deactivates engine braking when cruising. As for the rest of the V60 lineup, well, it says much about the technology behind the Drive E D4 engine I've been talking about that it delivers 181 brake horsepower performance, yet still a returns running cost figures better than those of the entry level 115 brake horsepower D2 variant. This model uses basically the same 1.6 litre diesel you'll find in a Ford Focus to achieve 68.9 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 108 grams per kilometre of CO2. Not far behind that is the 2 litre 136 brake horsepower D3 version which manages 62.8 miles to the gallon and 119 grams per kilometre. Even the 215 brake horsepower 5 cylinder 2.4 litre D5 model delivers 61.4 miles to the gallon and 120 grams per kilometre. For completeness, I'll also give you the figures for the two minority interest petrol variants the 150 brake horsepower T3, managing 47.1 miles to the gallon and 139 grams per kilometre, and the rare 306 brake horsepower T6, delivering 42.2 miles to the gallon and 157 grams per kilometre. I should also touch upon the rare diesel electric D6 plug-in hybrid all-wheel drive model for which Volvo claims a scarcely believable combined cycle fuel economy figure of 155.2 miles to the gallon and an equally impressive CO2 return of 48 grams per kilometre. Unlike a normal hybrid, this one, as its title suggests, can be plugged into your home or business mains electricity supply before use. and. Uh, when fully charged, can deliver an electric only range of up to 31 miles if you choose its pure driving mode. St statistics suggest that over 75% of owners will cover a lesser distance than that on a daily basis. So, for these people with this car, the enticing prospect of fuel free motoring beckons. And they won't have the so called range anxiety issue that affects owners of full electric cars because when the batteries get depleted, you just move seamlessly into diesel power. Now, unfortunately, this model's high price tag, around £45,000, even after government subsidies, will make this D6 variant an unusual sight on British roads. What else? Well, across more common models in the V60 lineup, residual values won't quite be up at prestige German brand levels, but they'll be a cut above the mainstream. And insurance groupings seem to be affordable, especially if you opt for this D4 model, which has been pitched at Group 26. Insurance groupings start at 17 and won't rise above 31 for diesel models. There's also Volvo On Call, a downloadable mobile app that puts you in constant touch with your car. Now, via this, you can check your fuel, uh, request roadside assistance or emergency help, uh, report your car stolen, and have it tracked for easy retrieval. The app will even help you locate your car if you've forgotten where you parked it. And if you lock your keys inside the vehicle, it can remotely unlock the doors for you. Very clever. Volvo Estates aren't what they used to be, and in this case, that's a very good thing. This V60 will, I think, find it easier than its S60 saloon stablemate to conquest sales from German rivals, thanks to more stylish looks that build upon class-leading safety, solid build quality, and a cool, classy Scandinavian feel. Particularly as in this case, for the first time, these virtues have been fused with more vibrant design, a driver-focused chassis and high-tech engine technology. 
It's that last element that should really revitalize this car's appeal as a more cost-effective alternative to German brand compact executive estates. Any car that can deliver 99 grams per kilometer of CO2, 62 miles an hour from rest in around seven and a half seconds, and nearly 75 miles to the gallon in regular use has to be worthy of anyone's respect. A small brand Volvo may be, but it's punching well above its weight here. This then is a tale of the unexpected, both in style and speed. True, the sweeping shape has required practical compromises, but the result is a car that many buyers new to the brand may find hard to resist. If you're just about to sign for a premium A4 or 3 Series sized estate, then it might be worth trying one of these before you do. Sweet dreams might just be made of this.